So uh, at the outset, uh, I thank Prashant for including me in his course. And uh, uh, so let me start my presentation with this uh, uh, overview printout of a 25-year-old uh, juvenile open ankle glaucoma patient. is one-eyed actually, and had a trabeculectomy done about eight years back in his only seeing eye. And at present, the patient is maintaining a IOP of around 10. And you can see the stability of visual fields over the, over the past seven, eight years. A wonderfully stable visual field. Now, what this stability has done to him on the personal front is that he has got a job. He is now uh, married also. So, trabeculectomy is a procedure that can be vision saving as well as it can actually enhance somebody's life. So, you can have a huge impact by this surgery. So, in the next few minutes or so, I will be discussing some important tips and tricks of trabeculectomy, which should help uh, somebody who wants to start the surgery or somebody who is into early stage of glaucoma practice. So as we all know, when we talk about glaucoma uh, surgery technique or trabeculectomy, it's not at all standardized. And there are so many variable techniques that are there. And with variable techniques come variable results. So you get different types of blips, different outcomes. So that, that is a problem. So uh, at the moment, the state is like this, that whatever level of expertise you have, you still cannot predict what is going to be the outcome on the day one of a trabeculectomy surgery. And that's what makes it very, very exciting surgery to do. So when we do the surgery, the aim of the surgery is to essentially maintain, uh, a, a, to get a basically a very low diffuse blip, get, try to get a target IOP, which is without medication and as far as uh, possible, avoid collateral ocular uh, damage. The principles remain that you should have, uh, you should avoid sudden decompression anytime during the surgery. On table, you should do a meticulous suturing and avoid hypotony. And uh, it goes without saying that the tissue handling has to be very gentle. So let's start with the preoperative uh, consideration that one has to take. So whenever you are planning surgery for these patients, it's preferable to avoid postsecondary analogs and pilocarpine a week prior to the surgery because we know they are pro-inflammatory and they will induce big inflammatory response post-surgery. Try to quieten the ocular surface a week of uh, soft steroids like fluoromethanol can always help. Uh, anticoagulants, antiplatelets have to be stopped. Uh, before the surgery in consultation with the physician. And if you're doing a secondary trap, you need to basically look at the conjunctival mobility by using this cotton tip uh, applicator and try to see which zone is uh, relatively free, which, which area of the conjunctive is free. And hyperospadic agents, yes, they have a role, especially if you're dealing with angle closure glaucomas or if the patient's IOP is very high to start with. So this, these agents like mannitol will bring down the pressure just before you start the surgery. So coming to anesthesia, my uh, so there are different ways of giving anesthesia. I prefer to give posterior subtenance uh, because it gives me mobility during the surgery. But peripheral anesthesia probably is the most common anesthesia. What we have to remember are three important points that you should avoid excess volume, excessive volume. Uh, you should avoid vigorous massage and preferably use lignocaine without adrenaline because it can compromise blood supply to the optic nerve and uh, can compromise the optic nerve damage further. Uh, one of the indications for me in peribulbar anesthesia, if you have extremely deep set uh, globe, so adding volume behind the globe will bring the globe up and uh, it will make uh, things economically better. So this is how I usually give anesthesia. I, when I've made the, with the conjunctal opening, I just take a 27 gauge cannula, uh, which has a blunt tip and just go behind uh, in the sub tenance plane and inject uh, about two to three ml of uh, uh, lignocaine, which is without adrenaline. And basically what it does, is it helps in a rotation of the globe. So that, And I don't give it in the inferior quadrant because uh, I want the inferior rotation to happen for me to have a better exposure. In case you are giving anesthesia, obviously you don't to fix the globe. Either you can do it with a superior rectus uh, brittle suture as shown here, or one can give a, a, a 6070 vicryl or a nylon or silk suture, uh, one millimeter and, uh, anterior to the limbus and uh, one can then use this as a traction. So uh, the next important thing is a conjunctival opening. So you need to decide which zone, which area of uh, eye you are going to do the trabeculectomy. So either superior nasal or a superior temporal quadrant, you should decide and you should uh, keep adequate space for a future surgical need. So here we are doing a conjunctival opening with the help of uh, 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 Scott Caesar and we are trying to make, to go very gentle and we, and uh, then you basically uh, dissect in uh, posteriorly and create a good pocket so that you, if at all you're using mitomycin sponges, you can easily uh, accommodate them. And the cautery that we need to do is has to be gentle because excessive cautery will lead to skeletal 
uh, fibers contraction and subsequent difficulty in closure of the wound. So the next step is scleral flap creation. Again, there are different ways of doing it. Uh, so here we see a, a, a triangular flap being created. And uh, I usually use an 11 number blade and then use a crescent to bring to create a, to a plane. And uh, the thickness of the flap is important. It should not be very thin. Then there's a risk of uh, flap tear or it should not be very thick. It will lead to a premature entry. So here we have created the flap. And uh, as you lift up the flap, you can see the, the, the clear cornea thing there. And you basically uh, dissect up to the clear corneal space. And uh, then the other way of doing it is to create a rectangular flap, as we can see here. And uh, it's again a four millimeter approximately tunnel that you are creating about three millimeters from the from the limbus. And uh, you essentially tunnel it out. And uh, at this point, then you uh, um, take a uh, scissor and uh, cut it on the sides and that creates a flap. And in this uh, crescent makes a very, very smooth uh, intersurface. And next you come to the mitomycin C application. A mitomycin C application is a very common thing that we do. And uh, you need to take a decision about what concentration of mitomycin C you will do based on the risk factors. And you should take the decision beforehand. This is how you would make it. And uh, essentially you use uh, polyvinyl alcohol swaps uh, because they tend to uh, disintegrate less. And uh, you try to avoid uh, touching the the margins of the conjunctiva and uh, you place it as posterior as possible and over a large area. So placing it uh, over a large area will make sure you get a diffuse blip. And uh, the time can be between one to three minutes depending on what your protocol says. And, uh, and uh, once you have done this, uh, you need to, when you finish this, you need to bring out the swabs Count it before you are putting it uh, at the time of putting it. And it's very important to count it when you are taking it out. And once you've taken it out, you need to do a thorough wash. Now, sponge count is very, very important. And have a look at this survey, which was done very recently, where uh, glaucoma specialists in UK and Ireland were asked that, have you ever uh, had a retained MMC sponge uh, and fragment of sponge left in the eye? And I was surprised that almost 12% replied yes. So it is quite common than one, what we think. So the leaving a sponge is a very, very distinct possibility. So you have to have a very strong uh, uh, suspicion about the sponge. So maintain the sponge count. The other issue with the topic, the sponge mitomycin application is the variability of the outcome. So in here, what we have seen that uh, you can get an absolute flat blip to a, a white, what we call it as a white bone. Uh, so with the same uh, surgeon, same sponges, same uh, where, uh, duration of application. And why does this happen is because the, 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 the sponges that are pre prepared, they deliver different dosage of uh, mitomycin uh for the same surgeon or across different surgeries so so that is the problem with the sponge application of mitomycin c so uh, all these difficulties has made me actually to shift to a, what is we call it a subconjunctival mitomycin c which is also not uh, which is very simple to give actually it's uh, just given as a 0.1 ml solution with on a tuberculin syringe with 30 gauge little given about uh, 9 to 10 millimeters away from the limbus and you, you basically, once you have given that, you use a cotton tip applicator to, to block the exit and basically roll this, uh, this um, bleb of uh, uh, the injection uh, posteriorly away from the limbus. So this basically ensures uniform application of the mitomycin C. And the most common use concentration is about 0.1 milligrams. And this is the way you make the solution. So basically you dilute the mitomycin C with uh, lignocaine. So if you are, have a 0.4 milligram uh, per ml ready, you just have to uh, add 0.3 milli milliliters of lignocaine and that will give you a 0.1 milligram per ml thing. And uh, once you have done the mitomycin, then uh, you go in with your routine uh, surgery and you use a pre-placed suture here. Pre-placed sutures are important because once you have done the, the sclerotomy, uh, sclerotomy you would want to close the, the globe as soon as possible to avoid prolonged hypertony on table because that can give rise to cascade of problems like, like uh, choroidal detachment and other issues. So a pre-placed suture is always a good idea. And uh, then you, before making the sclerotomy, you have to do a, a small side port entry, which has to be a little long and a small entry and which will allow a very regulated release of aqueous from the anterior chamber. And this will ensure that when you're doing, doing a sclerotomy, there is no sudden decrease in IOP. 
And again, that will prevent, uh, especially in patients with angle closure glaucoma and small eyes, it will prevent complications like supracarotid hemorrhage. So, and uh, post uh, surgery, this same board can help in uh, deciding about the flow from the flap by, by injecting BSS. Now, uh, before we do trabeculotomy, let's let's uh, look at the the anatomy of the limbus, and this is very important because where, what exactly are you cutting? You have to know this. So, when we talk about uh, anatomy of the limbus, there is something called as a surgical limbus and an anatomical limbus. What you are seeing is the anatomical limbus, and if you impose surgical limbus on that, so there is something called as a mid limbal line, which is essentially uh, a junction of the gray and the white uh, 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 portion of the limbus. And one millimeter in front of it is the anterior limbal line, which passes through the termination of the Bowman's membrane. The mid limbal line passes through the termination of Desperate's membrane. And one to 1.5 millimeter posterior is the posterior limbal line, which, which touches the scleral spur. So when we do, when we remove the block of uh, trabeculectomy tissue, basically you are entering from the cornea, you're removing part of the corneal antelium, corneal tissue. Majority is that corneal tissue only. Some part of trabecular measure does come in. And if you go very posteriorly, you might uh, actually have some part of the skeletal tissue. What is advisable is that don't go very posterior because then you can come very close to the skeletal spur and to the root of iris where there is major blood vessels around and there is a high risk of thing. So this is what I was mentioning. The junction between the, the gray and the white zone is the middle limbal line. Just behind that is the trabecular meshwork and uh, one millimeter in front is the anterior limbal line and one millimeter posterior is the posterior limbal line. So once you make the flap, you can see this, uh, the gray zone is the zone of cornea as well as some part of the sclera. So you don't want to enter uh, on the white portion of the eye, which is basically the scleral tissue. And the more posterior you go, the, there's a chance that you will end up in bleeding and ciliary body injury. So this is the stoma correction. And let's see how the stoma is being made. So here we have uh, entered, sorry. So here we have done the uh, entry with the side port and uh, uh, knife and then, and there are ways of ma making it. I prefer it with the Kelly sponge. And uh, stay at this point, uh, I am not going to posterior. I'm just removing the this block. And uh, around 1.5 millimeter uh, of uh, opening is sufficient. And what you see then is the, the iris there. And then you just have to pull on the, the iris and do a peripheral iridectomy. And uh, then you have to wash it to remove the pigments that are, that come there and make sure that the iris opening is uh, patent. And then comes the releasable suture. Now, releasable sutures are really a boon in trabeculectomy surgery because a lot of centers don't have uh, argon suture releases. So you can put in as number of releasable sutures as possible, titrate it on table. Like here, we have put one releasable at the apex uh, and uh, there you can still see that there is some flow there. So essentially, then you can go ahead and put uh, another resistible at the base. So uh, there are times in majority of my cases, I have almost three resistibles and I can remove them as at my will and whenever I feel that there is a little under filtration. So the point here is that uh, on table, it doesn't matter if it filters that much or not, because you always have a control after the surgery. But if on table is leaking too much, then there is a problem of hypertony in the post-surgery, which is difficult to manage. So here we have put three releasables and this is how we do put releasables in, in a rectangular flap. You essentially put two releasables at the thing and you basically want the, the, the flow to happen between these two releasables. And then we come to the conjunctural closure and uh, here you basically put a, 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 a box suture and, uh, and this is uh, how you close it out. The disclosure is very important because you don't want any leaks in the post-op period that can still happen. And uh, here is the is the matrix suture that we take on one of the uh, central incisions, and you ensure a complete closure here. You can also take one uh, central box suture, uh, anchoring the the conjunctiva to the cornea uh, in the middle. That will ensure that the the the, the flap doesn't recess back. And uh, that's how uh, the, the post-op outcome comes with the, with the standardized technique. You tend to get more of uh, posterior blips and they are quite diffuse. And uh, listen, let's see some problems of uh, trabeculectomy. So here we can see a flap being made. And I noticed that there is some, uh, the flap has become a little superficial. So uh, in fact, uh, at this point, you can see that there is a little bit of flap tear. So how do you handle this? So you continue dissecting it at a different plane. And you do trab on a little uh, eccentric uh, side. And uh, at the end, you just have to suture the, the flap tear and the, the, the thing gets managed very well. 
So this is another case so who had an angle recession glaucoma, and uh, you can see that there is a uh, corneal opacity which uh, which uh, happened because of the uh, the side port entry into the anterior chamber. So uh, unfortunately, the uh, eye was dilated that day because of the mistake, and the pilocarpine did not work. So that happened. So this can happen. So luckily, we were lucky in this case that it did not progress. This is a patient who is a patient of eye syndrome, and uh, as we were doing the the tunneling. So here we are seeing the other side of the tunneling thing. We have gone very deep actually. So you can see the flap is quite thick. And when we lift the flap, we see that we have already entered anterior NDH chamber. So there's a premature entry. Now in this scenario, nothing much has to be done. Your entry is already there. You just have to regularize, uh, regularize that entry and, and do a PI and close it off because you will anyway get the, the leakage from this point. So this patient had operated about six weeks back and uh, she's actually doing very well. This is uh, just a 30-year-old lady who had a very high pressure to start with. Sometimes you are faced with this issue where the iris kind of pops out and uh, you wonder what to do. So at this scenario, if you do PI, there is a high chance that you might make a very big PI uh, than what you would like to do. So best is to, in this scenario, is to kind of reposit the iris and then uh, do a PI. So here we can see that I'm using iris spatula, bringing it down and then do a regulated PI on the uh, on the iris in the standard way. So these are some of the things that we need to take care of. Roshant also asked me to speak uh, for a few slides on uh, trabeculectomy. So I'll be speaking in the next two, three minutes about trabeculectomy, trabeculectomy. We all know that trabeculectomy is single side procedure or a two side procedure. Now, single side procedure has an advantage that you can do it in, uh, very fast because it's the same opening you use for fake hole muscle regression as well as for trabeculectomy. But the chance uh, uh, of regulating it post-operatively becomes less because they tend to have more inflammation at that side and chance of failure is high. So most of us do actually two side procedure. Here, everything is the same. You basically do a temporal clear corneal incision. What is important is that the clear corneal incision has to be sutured before you proceed for the trabeculectomy. Now, when you decide about FACO trabeculectomy versus plain trabeculectomy, one has to understand that plain trabeculectomy will give you a better success outcome, better blep height, higher, but there is a higher risk of complication and 50 to 50, 40 to 50% will eventually develop cataract over a period of five years in these patients. But with FACO trab, you have a decreased chance of success. The bleb may not be very high, but there is a higher risk of complications due to cataract surgery and that can lead to failure. And you can have early post of complications like overfiltration and flat chamber, which are quite rare compared to a plain trabeculectomy. So when you do FACO trab, you should go in for a higher MMC concentration. You should have a lower threshold for remaining releasable and you should be giving more five FUs. And uh, in a senile age, if you have angle crochet glaucoma, it's always better to combine the two. And if you don't have too much of cataract, it's better to look for peak cataract exchanges and advise combined surgery, especially if you're doing for a primary open angle glaucoma. Now, in some patients, uh, the main concern is to control the IOP, like, uh, and it's a very complicated cataract surgery. So it's better to do a trap first and then do a PECO. Like this case had a, had a significant zonular weakening all around post trauma. And we can see that here, when I'm taking up this patient for a trap only because considering that FACO would be difficult. So when I was doing the trap, you can see that the, the vitreous has come from the, from the main wound and uh, we are doing a vitrectomy here. So this case, anyway, with, with the vitrectomy and everything went off well, the iris was back to the normal levels. And most importantly, the pressure got controlled from levels of 50 to settle to around 15, 16 with a successful trap in spite of vitreous prolapse there. So in this case, later on, we did a FACO surgery in a more controlled way uh, after three months and with the CTR and everything in place, this patient did well after the cataract surgery. So sometimes you have to make that decision. Uh, just a small case uh, showing a one-eyed lady who first comes to you with a, with a, with a test, uh, with a bi-arcuate defect like this in a bipolar notch. Don't jump to FACO trap immediately. What you can do is you can do a DVT, see what is the level of pressure, see if you can reduce the pressure by 30%. And then if you're able to do that, you can just go in for do a cataract surgery and then keep a patient under watch. So it's not that you cannot do a trap later on. You can always do a trap if your target pressure is maintained with thing. Uh, so another lady who had primary open angle glaucoma on three medications, a lot of times uh, practitioners or general practitioners, not glaucoma surgeons, uh, don't want to fear with this uh, thing, what is called a split macula, and then they just advise phaco surgery. But just a precaution here, because a wipeout phenomena, we know the factors which are important for a wipeout phenomena are here, of which post-operative IOP spike is one. So in such a scenario, we would always want to combine phaco and trap because this will prevent this IOP spike and reduce the chances of wipeout. 
and uh, white wash phenomena is not that common because this has been shown in a study by dr b shanta where they did uh, 65 eyes with split, split uh, fixation teco or teco trap and none of the eyes lost any vision so i would conclude by saying that uh, one should follow all the principles of trablet commit and that will definitely give you a very predictable outcome in most of your cases combining trabeculectomy with cataract removal is a decision that should be individualized threshold for lens removal is low especially if one is dealing with angle closure i thank you for your patience